Oh, good evening, everyone. My name is Rick DeYoung. I'm the Artist and Educator Relations Manager here at KHS America, and I'd like to welcome you back to our Thursday evening. Uh, this is the seventh one that we've done, and we're really glad that you can join us. Just a little housekeeping things that uh, those of you uh, in the education world, you will receive within an hour of this event, uh, an email with your certificate for your professional development hour. Also want to make sure you take advantage of the chat section on the right hand side of your screen to get engaged not only with uh, our clinician tonight, but also with each other. And also take advantage of the fact that you are here doing this live that uh, go ahead if you have a question for a clinician that you populate that so that she can get to that as well. At the conclusion of this, I will come back on to talk a little bit more, some upcoming things, um, as well as thanking our clinician again. So uh, I've already looked at uh, a lot of the people that have joined us, and I see so many friends that are coming back again and again, and we really appreciate uh, you joining us, and we hope you're getting a lot out of all the events that we were doing for you. So without further ado, uh, tonight we've got Kickstarting Your Jazz Band, How to Get Your Band Swinging and Playing the Blues, and so I'd like to welcome to the stage our clinician for this evening, wonderful teacher. I know firsthand she was my son's eighth grade band director. I won't say how many years ago, I'll give it away, but please welcome uh, Tanya Matthews. Hi, thank you so much, Rick. Um, it's really great to be here. Really great to be here. Oh, and she put my thing up there already. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, how do I now see um, the answers to the polls? Can um, Before we get started, I'd like everyone to answer those two questions so I kind of get an idea of who I'm talking to, and then we'll kind of move on. Okay. Um, I am a band director here in Texas. Um, I grew up in a very, very small town of Wisconsin called Wyiwiga, and um, I didn't have any jazz education in the middle school or high school. So if some of you are in the position of, oh man, I, I'm, I, I gotta start a jazz band, I've never done it before, or maybe you're kind of in a rut of what you've been doing and it's not working, um, I, I really have uh, hopefully some great ideas for you today based on uh, my 25 years of teaching and 24 of them have been in jazz education. And I have learned a great deal um, living in Austin, learning from our jazz musicians here in town and all, all the great jazz educators we have here. Um, as well as I've been uh, experienced with the Essentially Ellington Festival when I taught in the high school level and was... Um, able to perform for, you know, Wit Marcellus over there in New York City way back in 2008 when I finished my high school career of teaching and then moved on to middle school after my son was born. So I'm now doing middle school jazz band and I love it. It's super fun. So I hope to give you some advice for starting your jazz band or um, just giving you some new ideas. Okay. Um, is there a way for me to see the poll answers? I can't see those right now. You should be able to, Tanya, if you look over at the chat, the questions, you see the thing that says polls? On I see right. polls and I'm clicking on it. It's just showing me the questions myself. It's not uh, showing me the answers. Okay, well. I, Maybe if I answer it, it will tell me. I don't know. Maybe it's just for <laughs> Jen and I. So we've got. Oh, wait, uh, now I see it because I'm answering them myself. Okay. All right. All right. Good. Okay. We got 50% middle school, some high school, some don't teach jazz. Okay. I see it now. Many of you teaching over 11 years and some have never taught. All right, great. All right, cool. So um, how do you start a jazz band or how do I begin the year of my uh, jazz band for my kids? Um, having taught both at the high school and middle school level, um, the first thing I really, really like to do is play the blues. So the first question here on my slide, do I pick out a chart for them to learn? For me, the answer was no. Uh, the last thing I want to do when I'm starting the year is have them look at a sheet of paper and, you know, just try to read notes and rhythms. I don't want to do that. I want to set up a nice community um, of students kind of learning together and feeding off each other. So I set them up in a circle and you'll see that in the videos I show you in a little bit. 
and it's kind of like a box or a circle if you will and then everyone's looking at each other and i'm kind of in the middle and we're all kind of feeding off each other when we're playing uh, should I hand the music again me? No, I don't hand them any music um, in the beginning of the year I might hand them a blues tune and Some staff paper if they want to write their chords down But that's basically it and we kind of just work on playing by ear or by listening to what I'm telling them at the beginning of the year So the first thing um, we do when we're getting together and we're playing especially at the middle school level is starting the band in concert F. I try to focus on things that the kids know, basic rhythms, the Remington and basic scales. So if, if I got seventh graders in my jazz band, they maybe know concert F, Remington, they maybe know a couple major scales. So we kind of start with that. And I, I try to teach it so that they're not looking at their music. So if you think of um, how people, you know, would learn jazz back in Louis Armstrong days, they would learn by listening to each other and playing back what they heard. So I try to treat the beginning of rehearsals um, like that so that we're listening to me and playing back what they're hearing from me without looking at music. And this will help gear them towards a level of confidence of playing without looking at notes and starting the improvisation process. So use what they know, concert F connected quarters. So your, your kids might not know how to play, do, 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 do. They might go ta, 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 ta. Okay, so we work on that a lot. Um, at this time, I have my drummers doing four to the floor on the bass drum, especially if they're a beginner. And then eventually I start um, my kid on hi-hat on two and four. So we're doing bass drum first, not too heavy, nice and light on the bass drum, and then adding hi-hat on two and four. Now, as the band is playing connected F quarters, once we go around the room, we make sure everyone's doing that right, because jazz is smooth music. We don't play a lot of short stuff, which is what some people think, and that's not true. Um, we want to do da do da do da do da do We're eventually getting to that point. So um, let's see if I have a video on that one yet. Not quite. Oh, yes, I do. I'll pop that up here in a second. So progressing to the band doing accents. Another thing that beginner kids can't play well or kids new to, new to jazz in general is how to accent something. So again, without showing them music that they have to learn how to play a bunch of hard notes and then try to accent and play smooth, we do it on one note. So we're going around the room. Do da, do da. Then I do it in sections. Brass play, brass play. And at this time, my drummer's going two four on the hi-hat and then eventually switch into the right chain chain a lane so believe it or not this process can take a good 30 minutes because they won't be able to play quarter notes together the rhythm section the guitar player the piano player just being able to line up quarter notes is really hard um and your piano and guitar players for the most part aren't students that are used to rehearsing so you kind of have to teach them that too you know they're used to just kind of playing in their room or playing a piano recital. So they have to get used to playing in a band setting. That's why that circle process is really good. So let me go ahead and pull one of those videos up right now. All right, yeah, here we go. Again, this is the beginning of the year. So these videos are my band a few years ago. My student teacher um, made these for me. <laughs> So I got some, some crazy kids in this group, as, as you'll see. Um, but we're working on, for the first time, playing accents on two and four, and we'll have a student leader kind of leading them. So here we go. Ready? And one, two, three, go. <laughs> They, they did pretty good with that. I know we had practiced it a lot before that time. Oh, my slideshow went away. Can you put that back up for me, please? I think I screwed that up. Yay, thank you. I forgot to minimize it. I'm sorry. I'll try to do it right next time. All right, so that's kind of the first process. We work on that a lot. And I always choose like a kid that can do it really well as the leader. Like you play it, the group play it after you. That really, really helps because you'll always have like three or four kids that can do that really well. Okay, next process. Now we're adding the swing. 
Okay, now before we do that, do your kids listen to jazz music? Most of the time, probably not. So make sure when they're coming in the room and they sit down, you're playing some good jazz music for them. Um, anything bluesy and that swinging is great. Try to get them not to talk when that's happening. I know that's really, really hard. So I try to get them set up as they come in the room listening to some jazz. We do our concert F and then we start singing. So uh, my accents, I, I use da. And what we're going to sing to find out the triplet, the triplet feel, is we're going to feel the middle part of the triplet. Instead of going right away, do, da, do, da, do. I don't want them to rush it, so I want them to sing do, do, da, do, do, da, do. And again, I'm putting the triplet on beat two and four. So the do here is just a quarter note, and I would write this on the board, quarter note. And then I'm putting the swing on two back to a quarter and on three and swing on four. So they're doing what the drummer's doing with the swing on the, on the ride cymbal. So they're going chang, chang, a lang. And then the rest of the band's gonna sing do, do, da, do, do, da. Notice I have da underline because that's your trip, that's your swing upbeat that you wanna emphasize. We're gonna play beat one and three loud. Do, do, da, do. It's gonna sound like that. And we wanna emphasize the swing upbeat. That's what makes it sound like swing. Do, do, da, do, do, da, do. And I really overemphasize that when I sing it. So hopefully they can sing it back. And then we try to play it on concert F. Play it and then go around the room. Um, as listed here, the drummer adds to the ride cymbal and they can play the, the triplets too. Two, triplet, three. Triplet one, and then when they're ready, they can take out that middle triplet note. Always keep it smooth, 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 smooth. Notice I'm not doing any dit stuff yet. We get to that, but we're not doing it yet. We're just working on trying to play smooth and together. Super important. Even with your high school kids, even if they're experienced players, it's not a bad thing to be doing this at the beginning of the year. All right, and then when we get to, you know, they're kind of figuring out that subdivision with you, get to the, um, take out the triplet note, the middle triplet note, sorry, and just do regular swing eighth on two and four. Do, do, da, do, do, da, do. And then one thing I like to do is like, maybe the trumpets are doing just regular swing, but the other half of the band is playing the full triplet and we kind of rotate doing that. That's really, really helpful. Okay, so I'm going to show you a video now of alternating triplet and swing ace. Let me get to that one next. And again, always have student demonstrators. Hold on a second. I forgot to minimize. I'm going to minimize first. There we go. And it's always the trumpet players that want to play beats one and three too loud, by the way. It's always them. And then while we're at it, I'm going to go to one more video. Yeah, I minimized the slideshow and it still went away when I came back. I'm going to show you another video here before we move on in the slide presentation. I call this one painful F swing around the room. So just letting you know, it's okay, you're gonna have bad days. <laughs> and this was kind of a bad day. So, so watch how we have a hard time with F around the room on this one.
I notice they're starting to rush. So what's happening, we're trying to pass that F around the room and they don't know when to come in. So that's why I'm calling this painful F around the room. They're speeding up, they don't know when to come in and they're having to play by themselves, which even though it's just one note, it does stress them out a little bit. And so again, this is beginning to get the kids used to playing by themselves in front of others, helping towards the improvisation process. That was a good one. There's a good one. Yeah, and the piano players will want to pick their hands up off the keyboard too much. And so you got, they have to keep their finger real close to the key so it has that smooth feeling to it. Otherwise, it sounds choppy to them. So yeah, that was not a good day for that class. All right, well, back to the slide. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> okay, the next thing is transferring swing to things they know. Again, without looking at music. Remington, those of you that know what, you know, obviously a, a Remington exercise is really easy to do. So one thing I, I like to do when they get used to the swing and doing F around the room is we'll transfer that to a basic rhythm um, for Remington. Do, do, va, do, do, va, do, do, va, do. The drummer keeps going. Do, do, va, do, do, va, do, do, va, do. And the drummer keeps time all the way through. And then of course you can go Remington up to concert B flat from F up to B flat. And again, don't let them look at music. I want them to listen to each other. Think, how do I change my notes? What do I got to do? They should have that kind of stuff memorized. So again, that's going to help them get around their horn, get around their instruments so they know how to improvise. <clears throat> okay. Another thing you can do is take some easy rhythms like Mary had a little lamb, jingle bells, and putting some swing to it. That just makes it fun. They know those melodies. Mary had a little lamb. You know, play it for them really easy and see if they can play it back to you. Just come up with a cool little swing rhythm you can put to simple melodies. They like doing that stuff too. It's a lot of fun. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, singing jazz rhythms. This is super duper important. Um, I have practiced this a lot. I've listened to other people sing jazz rhythms um, and try to emulate what they're doing. And it's really important for the kids to be able to sing it. If they can't sing it, they can't play it. I tell them that all the time. And the drummers need to learn how to do that too because they need to know the style and the feel of the piece. Okay, I have a question. Sorry, I didn't have my tab over on questions. Oh, hi, Chris. You mentioned piano players and guitarists who aren't used to band rehearsals. How do you approach recruiting those players and scheduling who aren't regular in band? Do you ever recruit bass players or drummers outside of band? That's an excellent question. Um, I'm fortunate at my school that we have a really solid orchestra program. And usually I get my, like the bass player you saw in that video, I, I get my bass players from our orchestra program next year. Actually, I'm not. Um, it's just a kid that knows how to play electric bass. His dad plays electric bass here in town. So sometimes it's that. Um, since we're in a kind of a music heavy town, it, it's not too hard to find a bass players for the group. Um, drummers are usually kids in my uh, percussion section at school. So it is a requirement at our school that they have to be in either band and orchestra to be in jazz band, except for piano and guitar kids. And every once in a while, a bass player, if I, if I really can't get one from the orchestra, I'll, I'll go outside of the orchestra and just put out an announcement in the school. Um, but I like my orchestra kids to be, you know, the bass players because most of the time I like my kids playing upright so that I can really play some traditional swing stuff. So I hope that answered your question. Nice to hear a question from you, Chris. Thank you. All right. Um, getting back to jazz rhythms. If at the end of this um, 
presentation, you're going to get a PDF file in the chat, and it's going to be the jazz rhythm warm up that I use throughout the year that helps them learn how to swing in all the different beats and how to come in on upbeats of rests. And then we're also going to give you a link to my article that I wrote on um, Band Directors Talk Shop that goes over all the specific information that you're kind of hearing in this slideshow, especially these jazz rhythms. This comes right from that, that um, article that I wrote. Okay, so notes on the beat, do. And sometimes I have it right, right then in their music. That's a do note, write it down. Da, these are long notes off the beat or tied notes. Do, da, or one, da. Okay, we always want to emphasize those a little bit more. Staccato notes are dit. Okay, and let me talk about staccato notes for a little bit. Um, I know some band directors in Austin, actually, who are afraid to teach middle school jazz band because they're afraid that their kids are going to put staccato notes at the end, tease at the end of their staccato notes in concert band. Well, I've been teaching jazz band for 24 years, and all you do is have to tell them not to do that in concert band, and they don't. And you just have to reinforce it. It's really not a big deal. So we actually practice that. I'm like, hey, in jazz band, you see a staccato note, you're going dit, but you better not do it next year when I see you in concert band, because we're going to go dit, not dit. And we practice that. And they just know not to do it. So that's not hard to teach. You just have to reinforce it a little bit. Okay, and then if you have a staccato note on an offbeat, or an upbeat. You have an eighth rest, eighth note. Mm, dit. And I have the n mm there because I have to feel the downbeat. So when we're singing mm, dit, mm, dit, if you don't do the n mm and in kind of inside your voice, feeling where that downbeat is, the dit will be early. Mm, dit, mm, dit. That will really help them a lot feel that upbeat. Okay, rooftop accents. Dot. A big A-H-T dot. I make them, I call them fat notes. Okay. Those are your rooftops. And obviously your rooftops on an upbeat, which are a lot of times look like quarter notes. Those are mm dot. So the same thing there. So make sure you're using a vocalization like that when you're singing new rhythms that they're learning. Okay. Um, rhythm is important. <clears throat> Before I get into learning the blues changes, I want to tell you about a pitfall that I had teaching jazz band in my early career. I dove to way too much in the beginning of my career into theory and chord structure and stuff. And I forgot about rhythm. And the kids knew how to do everything and then all of a sudden I'd ask them to improvise and they didn't know what to do with the notes I was having them work on. So I kind of had to take a step back and, and assess what I was doing. And I realized I'm not teaching them the rhythms of jazz. So that's why it's really important to start out with rhythm and teach a rhythm to them every day. How you do that? Well, just look at some jazz band charts, pick out a rhythm you see, put it on the board, have that be your jazz rhythm of the day and learn it on concert F. And when they have more language of jazz and, and rhythms and how to articulate them, then they can start improvising using the rhythms that they know. And I always compare that to words. The more letters you know, the more words you can say and all that kind of stuff, it's just like speaking. So we, I try to talk to them a lot about that. Having a conversation with someone gets better as you get older because you know more words. Having a conversation is, in jazz is the same because the more you play your instrument and more notes and rhythms and style you know, the more you can, can improvise and play in front of others. So that's really important. Okay, learning the blues changes. I've done this several different ways over the years. And I usually don't like how it's presented in a method book because they'll do it in like six measures and six measures. And I like for the kids to see the blues progression in sets of four, three sets of four, because that's how the blues is organized. You got your first thought, your second thought, and then you know your answer to, to the two questions and a basic blues melody idea. So I, I give them some staff paper and the first thing we do is chart out four measures. And then we do that for three lines. So four measures of three lines each. Now, um, what key should you start in? Well, that kind of depends on what piece you want them to eventually learn. I either start out with a concert C 
and we learn C jam blues, or I start with concert B flat. Um, and then we learn blues by five, which will um, it's a, it'll be on my list there. You can write that down later. But I start with either B flat or C usually. And then I move on later to concert F, like in my jazz band right now. We just finished um, Now's the Time in concert F and Bag's Groove. So, you know, it's kind of up to you. If, if in a couple of weeks you want them to learn a specific blues chart, that well, then that's the blues key you should start in. Well, you might be thinking, well, I've, my kids have never played in the key of concert C. Well, your guitar player has, your piano player has, and so has your bass player. And they're really used to that. When they play in flat, flat keys, especially the for the bass player, that's actually really hard for them because they're not used to flat keys. And honestly, it's not hard for your kids to learn C concert. It really isn't. Okay? And it's a good experience for them. Okay, I start with Roman numerals over the right measures. They might not know what a Roman numeral is, so that might be the first part of your lesson. So they've charted out their four measures. They're going to put Roman numeral one with a seven. And then just tell them, hey, I'm going to explain to you what that seven means later. So we chart out where in the set of four measures on your three lines, where's the one, where's the four, and where's the five chord. And then um, I usually will just play blues by five for them, and we'll listen to it, or C jam blues. And we'll say one, second measure, one, the next line, four, and they sing back to the one. We just sing through the whole chord progression that way so that they know where those chord progressions are. So we do that as soon as we wrote, write that chart out. And then we start playing whole notes on the roots. So you have to have a real big explanation about root notes. I say the root is the name of the chord. Now you have transposition kids in your class. So what I would do is I would have three different colored uh, dry erase markers. So as I'm telling the kids what their root note is for C7, I'll take a rhythm section, we're in C blues, your color is gonna be black. So you're gonna follow the chord changes I'm writing on the board in black. Trumpets, you're gonna be red because you're gonna be in the key of D. Alto buried, you're going to be in the blue color because you're going to be in the key of A. And they just know what color to look at when I write the colors of the chord changes on the board for them. So I write it down, then they write it on their staff paper. Again, we're not writing notes in the staff at this point. We're just writing C7 above the measures and when they begin. And we play those in whole notes. That'll take a week, maybe two weeks. It kind of depends on how many times you see your kids. Now, the third bullet here, add the seventh. I've ch um, that's a recent change I've made. I used to teach the kids to go up to the third first, but I've kind of changed that. Oh, I, I teach them to go down to the lowered seventh. So in other words, they're playing C, and then they play the lowered seventh of the chord, which is B flat. In the beginning, I don't tell them too much about the theory of it. I tell them what that note is, and that's a whole step below the root. And I just say, hey, that's the seventh of the chord, and you can play it down there. So th in that case, I say write in your music your C. I'll write it in. Now, below that, right next to that note, just draw a circle B flat. And then I'll write it in the other keys for the other kids, D7 and A7. They'll write it in their music. And so then we'll play C, B flat, or C. B flat, C, and then you can come up with a bunch of different rhythms. Ba, boo, wa, ba, ba, do, wa, ba, boo, do, ba. And you just come up with a bunch of fun rhythms on those roots and sevenths, and you can play along with that for like weeks. You really can. So I would do bullets one, two, three, and four a lot with them on a daily basis. Maybe have kids take turns who's going to try to improvise on those notes. And when you're doing that, maybe just start with the one chord first. Maybe just do four measures at a time and be real patient with them because, you know, they're going to be a little bit nervous. OK, um, in the meantime, you're going to have to go over to your guitarist and show them um, a chord chart on how to do their voicings for that. And then you're going to have to go over to your pianist and show them their voicings for that C7 chord. And you might just have them play the root in seventh first. They're doing what the other kids are doing. And then eventually you'll you'll add the rest of the chord notes for them. Um, now this next bullet here, show them how or add the third of the chord. So 
Once they got the roots and sevenths really good, then we're going to add the third, um, C to E, and so on, and half notes, quarter notes. Again, you come up with a cool rhythm to do that with. And then maybe say, okay, this time we're going to improvise on the roots and sevenths. Next day you have class. Okay, today we're going to improvise on the roots and thirds. Now you'll have a couple kids that say, Miss Matthews, can I use both? And you'll be like, yeah, you go do what you want to do. Let them have fun with it. Let them experiment. And again, maybe take it four measures at a time because they're going to have difficulty going to that four chord. So you could be like, okay, we're going to play four measures and then go to one note in the four chord and maybe stop and see how they do. And then maybe try to go two measures of the one chord where it moves into the five chord in measure nine and then stop and see how they do. Um, show them how the third moves to the seventh in the next chord for smooth voice leading. I just did this recently with my kids and online, and, and it was very, very, very hard to do online. It's much easier in person because I can kind of chart it out for them. But if they can kind of understand eventually that this, you know, the third of the one chord goes down a half step to the seventh of the four chord, that's going to open up. Oh, wow, that's pretty easy. I mean, I just go down a half step and I can improvise on that note. It really kind of makes things um, a lot more sense to them and how things are so close together. This will take a lot of time and repetition. Most importantly, do not sacrifice style or timing. Really, really don't do that. Um, if they're not playing the right style, it doesn't matter how many notes they're playing. So, and sometimes I'll pick up my horn and I'll play like in the wrong key, but have really good style. I'm like, didn't that sound good? And they're like, yes, but did I play all the wrong notes? Yes. And then I played all the right, I'll play all the right notes for them and I'll have really bad style and be like, oh, that's not very good. I'm like, yeah, I know. Cause the style and what you're, and how you're playing is more important than what. So we work on that a lot. The last thing I do is I add the fifth of the chord. And, and at that point in time, you know, I'm kind of doing it as a scale pattern. One, two, three, four, five, or we're doing root seven, root two, three, four, five. So they don't think they have to jump all the way up to the seventh above there. And then have some of your kids experiment with playing some of that in the upper octave if, if they have the range to do so. I use a lot of call and response. Um, one thing I, I do in class is they have to come up, this will be an assignment. I'm like, come up with your own two measure idea or I'll call it like a formula. One, three, one, seven, one, or whatever it is. And they have to play it for a friend and teach it to a friend. We kind of go off in groups. So um, that makes it kind of fun. How do I approach recruiting players and scheduling who aren't regularly in band? That's the same. Oh, I'm sorry. Different question. Do you pick the rhythms the students use in these examples or do they experiment on their own? Both. Sometimes I'll just, I'll give them the idea, like you can do something like this and I'll make them do it. We'll do it as a class. And then, you know, if we were in person, I would say, okay, break off into your own groups and teach your own idea to a friend. Uh, in the virtual world where I have most of my kids online, we um, go into breakout rooms and I have them do that. Then they come back and, and play for me what they've learned. Okay. Just can't remember if I had a video on that one. All right, I do. So I'm going to stop talking for a little bit and go do a couple um, videos I have on doing the full progression of the blues with the roots of the chord. So you can kind of see what that looks like. One, three, one, two, three, go. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to do another one so you don't have to pull up the slide again. So we're going to go to another one. So that's them playing around on the roots. Now we're going to do smooth voice leading. I could call that third to fourth. Yeah, I think that's this one. Okay, here we go.
still, they went down a half step when they got to the four chord so that they knew that, okay, now I'm on the seventh of the four chord. Listen to that again, kind of hear what they're doing. Yeah, and so we would do that then. Um, then we would go from four back to one and hold, and we would do one to the five chord and hold. So we would continue that process um, all the way through the chord changes, and then we would stop. So I'm going to shut that one off. I think there's one more I want to show you before we go on. Make sure I had this one loaded up. Oh, yeah. So now next, these are the blues changes we're playing uh, with rhythms. One, three, one, two, three. So uh, what I did is I assigned a note in the chord to them at the beginning, and then I told them when we get to the next chord, I want you to move to any note in the chord that's closest to the one that you just played so that they're practicing good uh, voice leading. Yes, ma'am, because when you're playing, the, I, I'm answering a question, is it root to third and the seventh of the four chord? Yeah, because it's a half step down. Now that rhythm that they're they're playing, we might use that as like a background riff when kids solo. So that's something we'll just kind of come up with and learn and play together. Again, they're not looking at any written music right now. They're probably just looking at their chord chart. And they may have written the rhythm up on the top, but they're not looking at written music um, at, at that time at all. Okay, so uh, we can go back to the slide now. All right, so um, when do we add the melody? Once we uh, get the roots of the chords down, I will actually start working on the melody because, you know, they don't want to just work on chord changes and rhythms all the time. They want to play something that has a little more meat to it. So um, I'll start working on the, on the melody at this time as well, kind of a little bit after. We'll do a little bit of chords, a little bit of rhythm. Okay, here's the melody we're going to learn. So um, C Jam Blues, Blues by Five, I usually rotate those, you know, because I'll have kids playing, you know, as uh, a seventh grader and eighth grader. So I'll either start with one or the other, then we move on to any of these tunes here that are great for teaching the blues and so many great recordings of all those tunes, you know, um, that you can play for your kids. Just awesome. Uh, again, we try to learn by ear, um, especially like blues by five and C jam blues. I, I might not give them the melody. We might just learn it by ear. Of course, the rest I'll, I'll, I'll give them the written notes to the melody if they would like them. Um, keep it simple. Sing the melody first. They should be able to sing it as well as play it. I'll have them sing along with me as I'm playing it. Um, again, only, you know, just do a couple measures at a time, just like you would for any melody that you're going to learn. I like to stick to tunes with, that are historically significant. Um, you know, you'll buy method books and there'll be some blues tune in there that just some guy wrote that has no significance to anyone in particular um, because they don't want to play the pay the copyright to, to put that music in there. So I have it. I, I ignore that stuff usually. Um, if you want to use a method book like Essential Elements, I, I do use that sometimes just to have some quick rhythms to reference. But with the exception of their St. Louis blues in that book, I don't play any of the you know, melodies that they have in there because most of them are not historical at all. So um, I like to just pick from this list pretty exclusively because they're the best. And that way you can talk about those musicians. You know, you can talk about 
Sonny Rollins. You can talk about Duke Ellington. You can talk about Miles Davis and all those guys. And it just makes for a great teaching um, and learning experience for the kids. Okay. I think, is this my last slide? No, I got one more after this. And then we'll talk a little bit more and see if you have any more questions. Um, and I do have one re more recording for you that I'm going to play um, in a little bit. I'll show you what the finished product is of their Sea Jam Blues they did that year. By the way, that band um, before was from two years ago, so they're now freshmen in high school, so a couple years old there. All right, additional suggestions for programming the full band. So a lot of people ask me, well, when do you hand out their first chart? Usually around the beginning of October. We start school real early here, middle of August. So we're learning how to play the blues. We're learning how to play rhythms. We're learning how to play articulations, playing together. We do a lot of listening and talking about history of jazz. Um, my, my classes are scheduled 90 minutes every other day. So, you know, I do kind of have to break up my classes with non-playing because I, I literally can't play for 90 minutes in a row. Their faces will fall off. So we do a lot of stuff in, in the middle of the rehearsal to make sure that they have some time to rest their face. So choosing tunes, um, be really uh, selective of your first tune. Like if you're, if you taught B flat blues, then make sure you're handing out a tune with a blues progression. You don't want to hand out something with really crazy hardcore changes that the rhythm section can't play. Um, so be really careful with that. And thankfully, a lot of pieces that you can buy right now, you can look at the score ahead of time. Um, easy swing tunes. Um, we, we learned one real cool this past fall online called Swing Thing. I can't remember who the composer of that one was, but the chord changes for that are, are really, really easy. One tune that I really love to play and the kids always beg me to play is Second Line. Joe Avery Blues, um, that's from the Wynton Marcellus collection. It's a Victor Goines arrangement, and that's B-flat blues, and that one's just awesome, and they will love it. Again, that was second line. Uh, easy swing tunes, and then pick pieces after that as you're going through the rest of the semester and going into the fall, tunes with AA, BA chord progressions. Um, I usually teach after we do a blues tune and a swing tune. One thing I would like to... Um, just give you as an advice that I didn't start doing till a couple of years ago. And I couldn't believe it took me this long to figure out. Take a couple of weeks, just learning the A part, skip the B if it's an A, A, B, A progression and go, go back to A because your rhythm section kids really need some time repeating those chord changes in the A form and do that a lot. And then when you feel like your rhythm section is ready to go on to the B section, then give them a heads up. Say, Hey kids, Next week, we're going to do the B part. The chord changes are different. Make sure you look at that this weekend. And then teach the kids the melody that are, that's in that part in the B section. And that's it's going to really help your rhythm section prepare a lot. Again, um, I pick pieces that are historically significant from the American Songbook. I don't pick Billy Bob's something or another um, usually. Like I, I did pick that swing thing chart because I thought it was fun. But I do try to pick pieces. Um, that are within a, a, and close to a tune that, you know, you can relate to. Paul Baker is from, I see your question, I'll get to it in a second. Paul Baker is a composer that probably many of you know. Um, he lives in North Austin, and he's got a couple of really, really great charts that are in the style of Count Basie. One of my favorites is Strolling with Sammy. It's in the style of Count Basie, and it's very accessible for middle school kids. So that's one really perfect example of a tune that's not an arrangement of a historical piece, but it's in the style of, and those are great too. Uh, kiss, what does that mean? I always tell the kids, keep it simple, silly when they're improvising. You know, it doesn't have to be a lot of crazy notes. Just keep it simple. Uh, and a couple rhythm section so thoughts here um, before I get to that question. Try to include the whole class in your discussion on learning voicings. Um, if you noticed in that those videos, I had two drummers. So they were rotating from vibes and drums, and I have them do that throughout the class period. So they need to know the, the theory background as well. Make sure your tune chord changes can be attainable by your rhythm section players. And then, yeah, I already mentioned this about the AAB form, AAB form part. Uh, Brandon, how does the rehearsal circle seating arrangement change when you have a performance? Good question. Do you have a particular setup for your students? 
Uh, uh, yeah. So about two weeks before our first performance, we'll go into a traditional setup and just a basic jazz band setup that anybody would use, you know, drums, trumpets, trombone, saxes. Um, I, I try to keep to a traditional um, setup of winds too. I, I'm not that person that's going to put 40 kids in my jazz band. I don't do that. Um, I know some people think we'll give everybody the experience and we'll then start a second jazz band. Um, you should have your 20 to 25 members like a traditional jazz band would be because then you're kind of, then you're just a concert band playing jazz music. That's just my personal opinion. So if you have a lot of kids interested in jazz, great. Then have two jazz bands, you know, start jazz band during lunch or something, come up with some other ideas. Um, getting back to the, um, that question though, when we do the, and you'll see this in the video of the kids performing, um, when we do the regular concert setup, the kids have to practice coming front to play their solos. And that's that's the learning experience that you have to really go over. So why don't I get to that right now? I'm gonna show you um, them playing C Jam Blues. So we worked on, um, darn it, oh, here it is. Yes, I do have it. When we have our December concert at our school, we, um, we have to play in a big gymnasium because we don't have a performing arts center at our school. And, and Rick knows this because I, I, I taught his son. Um, so we have a, our beginners are in the back there. We have some of our other kids in the back. So the jazz band's in the center and they're having to fill up this big gymnasium, which is hard because they've been playing the little band hall. And this is like their first big performance. So this is them playing uh, C Jam Blues. And you'll see how the kids have to come up front to perform. I'm going to skip ahead to where my kids have to come up and solo so you can see them doing that. Okay. Again, this is their first performance ever of this piece. Here we go. So we have to practice this a lot in class, coming up front, knowing when to turn around and how to get back to their spot, how many measures to play when that 12 measures is over. Now, as you can see, obviously some of the kids were a little more comfortable doing that than others, and that's okay. The, the, the big thing is getting up there and doing it in front of, there were probably 300 people that were in the audience, and they all, every single kid was required to play a solo. It's not an option to, to not do it. Um, if they're nervous about improvising, I, I'll tell them, you can write out your solo if you want to, but, but everyone has to play. And so they kind of just get used to that, that's the requirement. And, we just kind of continue to support them. Okay, I think we're in some final thoughts here, which is good. Um, these are our, some resources and things that I like to use. The Sure Real Easy Book. This one is awesome. Please get that. 
you're gonna it's in a, it will have a treble clef part a, a bass clef um b flat e flat book so there's five books oh i have a spelling error there oopsies um what's great about this book is the bass lines are written out and as well as the guitar voicings and the piano voicings so it's a great resource especially for your rhythm section kids so I highly suggest doing that. There's a bunch of great tunes in there that you can play throughout the year. And you don't even have to buy any big band charts if you don't want to. You could just use those. Um, the YouTube play along tracks. I'm sure you guys know that if you go onto YouTube and you type in, you know, play along blues by five, they'll have a rhythm section background that you can play to. I like to use a lot of the Jazz at Lincoln Center Jazz Academy videos um, as instructional tools. I've been using them a lot. A lot right now because of the online learning um, I also have had an assignment where I told the kids to find one that they like and report on it and that made that as an assignment eight note.com has some free stuff on there um, and then the preservation hall foundation has some um, traditional tunes that you can um, get there get, get from them for free okay great arrangers these are the arrangers i love for middle school and high school even some of them too i think that c jam blues one was a rick stitzel arrangement that we were just doing but um you guys know these guys paul baker roy philippe paul murtha mark taylor mike sweeney ralph ford i mean these are all my go-to guys for uh, jazz arrangements for your medium easy um and stuff and many of them write harder charts too of course especially paul and and, and mark so there you go that is my presentation slideshow uh video <laughs> stuff um i would like you um i would like our hosts to put in the chat um the rhythm and let's go ahead and bring that up real quick the rhythm um file that I like to use that was that rhythm PDF we could pull that up real quick and then link that in the chat for everyone so that it can print that on their own there we go so there's my rhythm jazz rhythm sheet that I use so you can use that to um, help teach you know how to swing on beat two how to come in on, on an upbeat of three and, and every two lines is a different beat that we concentrate on so if you could put that in the chat I'd like them to have that and then um, if uh do you want me to put the the article in the chat or or can you guys do that i think jen's working on that okay. while she's doing that she'll put the jazz rhythms over there too she'll let me know if she can't but uh, let me take this opportunity first of all to thank everybody for joining us this evening and a special thanks to uh to tanya for putting together this uh fantastic right down to the nuts and bolts of how to start a young jazz band. Um, thank you so much for all that. Do want to remind you that uh, your certificate for professional development, and David, I know you're here and I hope it does come to there you. If go. not, let me know. Um, and just as I mentioned earlier when we came on at the beginning that this was the seventh one that we've done, we are actually working on two more. I think that you will find very exciting. So want to make sure that you stay tuned. You have our Academic Alliance website and uh, also our newsletter. And Jen also will put into the site there if you need to uh, receive this information uh, that we do have a place for you to sign up to receive that because we will be having um, two more. Um, and we will make professional developments uh, certificate available for those two. But there are two very exciting ones that I won't share with you at this time, but be on the lookout for those coming up. So again, um, we want to thank Tanya and all of you for joining us. And um, so Tanya, if you want to. Yeah, are there any other questions? We have some time here. I'd love to answer any more questions. I'm, I, I tell you, it's if you if you're interested in what I'm what we're doing in, in Austin, COVID wise, um, I, I teach our school has 307 kids in band and I think maybe 25 throughout the two days are coming to school. So we're mostly zooming. But now that I've had my two va vaccine shots, I I'm teaching in person and zooming at the same time. We used to rotate the directors would one person would take care of the zoomies and one would teach in person. So now we're kind of doing it together and yeah, it's, it's not fun. <laughs> I'm ready for, you know, doing some live things, but we're going to start having some outside because it's nice and warm here, some outside after school rehearsals. So I hope you all are able to um, do things like that soon as well. And uh, please reach out to me. Um, I teach at Clint small middle school 
And I'll put my email in the chat. Ever want to ask me a question? Want me to do a clinic for your band if you're in Texas or I could do a Zoom clinic? That would be great. Feel free to reach out. Hi, Chris. <laughs> Hopefully I get to see you sometime soon. Thanks for coming. Hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you so much for coming.